My name is uh, Randy McKay, and uh, I'm going to give a description of a new feature that we're working on. It is not done yet. Um, it is follow me, or well, uh, drone-based follow is what we're calling it. Obviously, we've had follow me for years and years. Um, we, we showed it last year um, as well, using the mission planner. Uh, basically, uh, most of the follow me features that, well, all the follow me's that we've had up until now have all been ground station based. A special one about this one is that it is, uh, it's all implemented in, in the drones. So you, you don't actually need a ground station at all. So um, the way that it works at a very high level is we have a lead vehicle, um, and hopefully it creates an access point or, or some other, uh, you know, other radios can also be used, it doesn't really matter if it's a Wi-Fi, but uh, we're going to do a demonstration later and it'll be using a Wi-Fi access point. And then the uh, following vehicles, they all just see that access point and they connect. And uh, um, some of the nice things that we get out of this, uh, a fast response. So uh, there's no intermediate communication going down to the ground station and back up to the drone. It's directly from lead vehicle to the following vehicles. Um, also, like I already said, it doesn't require a ground station. So that could be interesting. Say, for example, you're doing, I don't know, maybe a mapping mission or something like that. You send out a bunch of drones together. It doesn't matter if you lose ground station contact halfway through. They're going to keep on following each other around uh, until they come home later. You can also leave up any time for any questions. Um, so, uh, this slide doesn't have a picture, but here are some of the um, uh, controls that you get. So, um, at the top, we have a system ID. You know, all of our parameters uh, usually start with a subsystem name, so in this case it's all, F-O-L-L. -L. We have a system ID, so you can put in the uh, Maplink system ID of the lead vehicle. So the, these parameters are on the following vehicles. Uh, if you leave it at zero, it'll uh, connect to the first vehicle that it sees. Um, then you can also provide an offset. So this is uh, you know XY 3D offset uh, in meters. Uh, it can be in net, or it can actually be in the uh, vehicle frame, uh, the lead vehicle frame. So that for that you use this offset type. So if you set it at zero, the offset will be in net, so northeast down. Set it to one, and it'll rotate around with the lead vehicle. Uh, then you can also do the um, yaw behavior of the following vehicle. So it can uh, do a bunch of different things. It can do nothing, just always point the way it was pointing when it started. Uh, or it can uh, point at the lead vehicle. So you can imagine in the future we might be doing a lot of videos where you've got you know, one plane or one copter you know, filming another copter. So it always wants to point at the lead vehicle. Uh, or you can make it so that it points in the same direction as the lead vehicle, which would be quite cool you know, if you're following behind it like this. Um, so yeah, we have a few different options. Um, it's got some safety features as well, that distance max. So you can you know, say, don't, don't follow the vehicle if it's more than 100 meters away. So if there's some kind of weird GPS position error and it says it's off in Africa somewhere, it's not going to go over there. Not trying to go over there anyway. Um, also, right now, uh, the messages that it supports, the global position int. So um, that's a very common message that we use in all of our drones to pass down the location and velocity for a ground station. The nice thing about using this one is that it's already there. So as we roll this out, different vehicles, um, different you know, they have different firmware on them, maybe, an older version of Rover, new version of Popker. All of them send this message, so it should work no matter what version the lead vehicle is using. Um, yeah, and also you can turn on and off the fall with this uh, command. Later on, we're going to add support for other messages that are already available. Like there's a do follow reposition, which allows you to change the offset on the fly. Um, and also, there's a follow target. Uh, which is really not meant for, um, well anyway, it, it's another message, it's a bit similar to a global positioning. Uh, the advantage is it has the acceleration as well. This one only has the uh, position and velocity. So, uh, there's a couple of, there's two basic parts to the um, follow. Just like, you know, if you look at RG pilot in general, there's this Definitely two very large parts to it, the estimation part and the control part, and they're, they're quite separate. So starting with the estimation part, it's um, it's a fairly simple estimation at the moment. Uh, if you see like P1, P2, P3, those are the positions that we're receiving through the global position int message. So we've received a message, we're a, we're a following vehicle, we've received a position message from the lead vehicle, and you know that's as, as, you know, as close as we know to the real position of the lead vehicle. So that arrives. And then, you know, maybe 200 milliseconds later, or maybe a second later, we're going to receive another message, which is going to give us P2. And of course, we're also going to get that, that velocity vector um, at the same time. 
So estimation, you know, um, we're, we're running our update rates, you know, our update loops at 400 hertz. So what do we do in between the, the 200, you know, during that 200 millisecond gap? Well, we just simply extrapolate the position now using the most recent velocity and the time. So you can see, though, that that leads to a bunch of errors. So that's what the P2 is. Um, so at the moment that the new P2 message arrives, um, you know, maybe that velocity vector was not exactly right, um, or, or even more likely the, the vehicle has changed its velocity in, in between those updates. So our P2 extrapolated is a little bit off uh, from the real P2. So we're going to, uh, you know, we need to deal with that in, in the future. For now, though, we just end up with a, uh, you know, an, an error. Um, yeah, so one nice thing about using the follow target message in the future is that we'll get an acceleration. So we have an acceleration, it's much more likely that that, that P2 will be closer, the P2 extrapolate will be closer to the real P2. Yeah, pretty obvious, right? Um, so then we have the controller. And, okay. Uh, I've learned a lot from Leonard over the, uh, you know, whatever, four or five, six years we've been working together. Uh, I'm still not the uh, control expert, um, but uh, I have learned a couple things from Leonard, and um, I've tried to incorporate that into this controller. Um, there's going to be a new version, I'm sure, um, once Leonard gets his hands on it, and we integrate it in with that with the new um, you know, position control method that, that he was talking about earlier. And this is the way it is for now. So, um, the, this is the lead vehicle, this is the following vehicle. So, the following vehicle is just using a velocity controller. So, we, you know, it's a very commonly used controller inside of our G-Copter. And um, so we need to just come up with a velocity vector which gets us to this target position. So here's the lead vehicle, and this is, we add on the offset and we get to a target position. So we want to get here. What we do is, so we need to get a velocity vector that gets us there. What we do is we actually take the velocity vector from the lead vehicle, and we copy that, and that becomes our basic velocity for this, for the following vehicle. Uh, but if we kept doing that forever, we would, of course, never get any closer to this, this vehicle. We just end up flying around in parallel with the other vehicle. So we also, you know, as we're flying around in parallel, we want to actually, you know, slowly get closer to, to the target position. So we very simply calculate a position error, which is, you know, the, uh, the distance from the, the following vehicle's position right now to its target position. We multiply it by a P gain, which turns the position error into a uh, velocity, a desired velocity. We add it on to that base velocity that we got a second ago from the lead vehicle, and over this velocity. So it's not super intuitive when you first like, think about how to solve the problem that you do it this way, I think. But you can imagine that over time, you know, it's, it's basically going to be following the, the lead vehicle, but then over time, you know, because of that position error and the P gain, it'll slowly slip in behind the lead vehicle. Um, great. Uh, so yeah, with um, with the you know controllers that Leonard is, is designing now, we, we should be able to more uh, directly just take that position error and the velocity and maybe even the acceleration from these vehicles and slip them all on the controllers directly instead of going through this little um, you know, summation that we're doing. Um, okay, so for those people who are digging into the RG Copter, RG Pilot Code, I just want to explain a little bit about the architecture. Um, so this is, this is the, the box on the outside is, is RG Pilot, and we have Madeline, uh, this is RG Pilot's whole, this is the, the vehicle code portion, like the glue, you know, the, the vehicle code portion. These are the shared libraries. You know, can share these across all the vehicles. So, uh, yeah, we have a, a Madlink message that comes in from the lead vehicle that goes into our GCS Madlink class. That gets um, shoved into our new AP Follow library. So that library is the one that is, you know, you know um, consuming these new Madlink messages. Uh, it calculates, you know, estimates the lead vehicle's position all the time. It provides some other nice-to-use features like. Um, you know, adding on the offset and rotating the offsets around, that, that sort of stuff. That's all done inside the AP follow library. The nice thing about doing it there is it can be shared across the vehicles easily. Right. Then that AP follow is, is um, uh, you know, that is being used by our new follow mode flight class, or flight mode rather. 
Um, this is actually the part that is doing all that, uh, coming up with the velocity vector. But that's all done inside of here. And then, a couple of interesting things happen. We take that velocity vector and we pass it into our avoidance library. So I'm not sure people know how we do our avoidance in Copter, but we have this library called AC Avoid. And it consumes all kinds of data from other libraries, like the fence and our proximity library, um, you know, or our LiDAR library, and also our beacon library. So it consumes all of those, and what you do is you pass in a velocity vector, and it says, oh, no, no, that's much too long, and you're going to go outside the fence if you try to fly at that speed. So it shortens it, or sometimes it shifts it a little bit so that you, so that you slide along the fence. That, that all happens inside of here. So this, with this way, we, we come up with a velocity vector, we pass it in here, it does all this checking for us with all that other data it's got, and it comes back with a different vector. And then we take that, we push it into our position controller, the next velocity controller, and then it goes down the regular path, you know, through the position control, attitude control, and then out of the motors. Right. Is the AC avoid, is that taking into account the other vehicles, so it doesn't no. slam into them? Okay, no it does not. But it's going to, I think. Um, as a minimum, yeah, here we are, future plans. Avoid the vehicle. <laughs> so, uh, I, I tried to add this. Um, it's quite tricky. Um, recently we've added support in Rover for the search defense. And um, uh, that, that gave us, and we actually we've had it in Cop for a long time as well, you know, handling support in search defense. Um, but basically, you know, we can handle figuring out, okay, with this trajectory and this speed, how long till I hit the edge of the circular event. So we've got this, you know, straight line and circle intersection um, uh, function. So we, we, but what we need for this is actually a sphere, right? We want to build a sphere around that, the lead vehicle. And so, say for example, the lead vehicle turns quickly and we want to be on the other side of it. I mean, there's many ways to do it, but the simple approach would just be to, you know, try and go in the direction that we want to go in to get to the target position and then but when we hit the sphere, that safety sphere around the lead vehicle, we sort of, you know, glide around it. That, that's what I like to do. Um, I don't have the algorithm for uh, a straight line sphere intersection. So if anybody has that, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the other problem with that too is uh, if you turn around, you're not you're not trying to avoid a stationary sphere like we or yeah. circle. So that those equations we can do that really easily. Yeah. But that sphere could actually be coming towards yep. us. Yep. In which case, um, we need to have a, ensure that we're ripping backwards or out to the side yep. to get out of that sphere yep. again as well, which is an enhancement over the yep. station geofence. Yep. Exactly, yeah. Um, and uh, I'd also like to add in avoidance for other vehicles. So, we just quickly go back here. You see that right now we have Feeding into the AC avoidance library, we, we support fence, uh, range finders, and the beacon. You know, if you have a beacon, you won't go outside the beacon fence. Um, I'd really like to actually take this some of this AP follow code, which is you know monitoring the lead vehicle, allow it to support maybe 20 or 30 vehicles, and in that way and make you know break it out into a new library. So now we're now we're tracking all the vehicles that we know about, all the vehicle, you know, all the data about their position velocity. We're taking all that and you know holding up and you know creating an estimate where all the other vehicles are, and then I'd like to feed that in here, maybe. Isn't that roughly what we're doing with ADS-B targets? Okay, yes, so, um, not, not exactly. Um, sorry, definitely yes, the monitoring of the, of the other vehicle's position, so we do that in ADS-B. So maybe we could take the two out, and you know, take that bit of logic out of ADS-B, and you know, put it in a new library or something, or use it somehow. Yeah, right now ADS-B is actually trucking the aircraft, where maybe it looks better <coughs> into, it'd just be a driver interface, and then we move that into an object tracker, which we kind of are with the avoidance library. We have this avoid and avoid library, which are. Yeah. And when Peter was actually working on the ADSB library, I believe he did something similar to this. Yeah, um, like half merge, you know, where we consume these you know global position ints and put them into the ADSB library, even though it wasn't ADBS, ADSB data. So you know, we've done kind of half done it already. Uh, all the way around, ADSB feeds avoidance, and other things feed avoidance, so it's. Well, okay, yeah, so Tom was actually going to do a talk originally on the difference between micro-avoidance and macro-avoidance.
and it could be a whole talk. I'm not going to give a whole talk about it, but uh, this is microwaves that we're doing. We're trying to we're trying to avoid objects that are quite close, um, you know, and, and therefore we need to avoid them very quickly. Macro avoidance is much larger, uh, further away objects. Um, the time frames are, are completely different. So EDSB is an example of what I call, maybe Tom would also call, macro weights. Uh, that's where, you know, we don't have to react in, in a second to an airplane coming by. We need to, you know, maybe in the next 10 seconds, we need to think about maybe moving away from it. But it's a completely different problem, or a very different problem, I think. Um, yeah, some other things, uh, more interaction, more integration with the ground stations, making it easier for users to um, you change the offsets and the behavior. Um, I'd also like to take the code and reuse it in a rover and tracker. Maybe add it to plane? What? What would tracker do with it? Um, well, tracker already oh, wow. has, especially for the estimation part, the tracker already does almost exactly the same thing, where it takes the velocity and the position of the vehicle and estimates its position during updates and message updates and, and basically aims the tracker at the vehicle. Right, so I'd like to, we just don't need that code in two different places. So the estimation part, I'd like to have share of the track. Um, some people also said they'd like it to accept user input. So we're using it with just a much more simple follow me where you're controlling the, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's chasing after you. You've got a ground station in your hand and you want to change the, where the vehicle is easily with a transmitter. You can do that, perhaps. That's not included in the current version. And, you know, maybe there's other features we want to add, like making the vehicle the following vehicle circle around the, the lead vehicle. Support scripting. Yes, this could all be done in scripting, perhaps. That's it. Any questions? Yeah. I'd like to see the safety situation where you imagine a swarm flying around and one drone goes awry and heads towards the highway, something like that. You need to be able to just sort of press a button and yeah. it'll stop exactly where they are or something like that. Yeah. When, yeah, once, I mean, Peter and I have, have been, you know, uh, playing around over the last day or two with multiple vehicles, and there's a whole bunch of challenges in terms of trying to get vehicles powered up for flying um, a reasonable amount of time. And certainly once it's in the air, how do you handle it? Does each one have its own transmitter? Um, at the moment, what we're doing, or what we're thinking about doing, is we, we do have one transmitter, which is connected to all the vehicles, and there's a kill switch on it, so you can pull them down all at yeah. once if you want to. And and we're, we're starting the follow me. We're testing following on these little guys. Yeah, you know, very little danger here. Um, of course, all the other regular fail safes are already in place. Battery fail safe, uh, fence, all those features are um, are there and active. So if it goes yeah. outside the fence somehow, it should try and come home. Uh, if it goes too far outside the fence, it should land. Yeah. Michael, it's the second bad. We can generalize enough the avoidance to take any other global position in as an ingress and just avoid in general. You recognize general behavior from you know playing or anybody else and just hey I know that that guy's bad at those he's not in follow anymore he's avoiding the swarm if I know where he is on the network I can avoid it that's yeah. always going to be bonus mm -hmm. keep it general yeah yeah I'm definitely hoping to be general all right any other questions all right thank you very much.